Um, my name is Ted Landsmark. I uh, am director of the uh, Kitty and Michael Dukakis Center for uh, Urban and Regional Policy. Um, I started in this position a couple of months ago. I'm having a heck of a good time. It's really fun. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, certainly, uh, the weather reports did not augur well for uh, what it would be like to uh, deal with logistics this evening, but I'm delighted to see uh, so many of you here. Um, I want to thank the, uh, <coughs> the crafts for making this kind of uh, public forum possible. Uh, you know, within the university, uh, we, we come together as faculty and as students and students and faculty and researchers and what have you, and we um, have the privilege really of having uh, deep and engaged conversations about major issues of public policy and implementation, but we don't often get to share that uh, in a forum where there is uh, open dialogue. Uh, and uh, where uh, there can be uh, civil uh, disagreement about uh, how uh, policies move forward. And this is one of the very few places anywhere uh, where that happens. So uh, our expectation is that uh, you will be deeply engaged in our conversation over the course of, of this uh, semester. Um, I also want to give you a heads up that in the spring uh, we will be uh, discussing the rule of law. Uh, we're going to be doing that jointly with the law school here. Um, this is uh, a subject um, uh, that was once considered sort of uh, dry and arcane, but the last uh, eight or nine months seems to have raised uh, the profile of of the subject matter. So in the spring, uh, in conjunction with uh, the law school, we will be uh, discussing the rule of law. Um, I, I want to introduce uh, my great uh, long-term friends, uh, Kitty and Michael Dukakis. I'm, I'm going to ask Mike to come up and uh, share his thoughts, uh, both about uh, tonight's subject matter and uh, also about uh, the uh, uh, structure of what it is we're uh, trying to accomplish within uh, these uh, open classrooms. Uh, but before that, I, I really want to thank uh, very deeply Barry Bluestone. Barry, would you just uh, We, we wouldn't be where we are in terms of the kind of uh, the service and uh, intellectual rigor and uh, a commitment to research uh, that is really useful, forcefully applicable research. Uh, without uh, the work that uh, Barry has done uh, over the years, and uh, I, I, he's passed the baton to me, uh, he will be here quite a bit uh, over the course of uh, this semester. Uh, indeed, uh, he will be presenting in next week's session on uh, housing. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Barry, for uh, all that you've done. And then I'll just make one uh, final point. I am a university professor, and I am used to standing when I introduce a course. <laughs> Please do not accept as disrespect that I am seated. But uh, midway through this summer, I uh, did something to my knee, and so I had some surgery, and so I'm, I'm only seated because I'm in recovery from uh, uh, knee surgery. Uh, and uh, I won't be hopping up and down a lot, but um, uh, I'm all here for you. So, Governor? Thanks, Ted. Thank you all very, very much. I guess that seat is for me, so I'm going to leave Barry, you and Judge Kitty. Um, but uh, first, let me say uh, how 
what a pleasure to see so many of you here, notwithstanding all of these crazy weather forecasts. I just called my very dearest cousin, who uh, been very close to years. He was born in Greenwood, South Carolina, and uh, ended up as an OBGYN in Fort Lauderdale. He was retired last year. And he speaks Greek with a southern accent. It's really very interesting. <laughs> I'm not doing Greek speakers here. But, uh, the Greek for how are you is what he said. But when it comes to taking excursions, it comes out, oh, she's sick. You know, it's kind of a sudden look. Anyway, he's, he just retired. He and his wife was in Fort Lauderdale. So I wanted to call him, ask him how things were going. And apparently there's a service down there now which shows up the day before the, the thing hits and sets things up, takes care of things, makes sure the generator is working on that kind of stuff. And so uh, they seem to be pretty good pretty shape you know, this, through this. Um, just to underscore what, what Ted said, we would be able to help our dear friend Barry, and uh, we are in your debt, my friend, for creating this series. And I think the turnout tonight, outstanding forecasts, is a testimony to just what you did. And Ted and I have been, well, I guess we're both recovering lawyers, right? Yes. And at one point, we actually practiced together. Um, <laughs> But we're not practicing law anymore. And actually, I think I'm much happier as a result of it. <laughs> uh, I'll be very brief because we've got a great panel here. Um, but I don't know of any of us who've grown up in this, you know, around the city that don't love Boston. On the other hand, the Boston of Kitty's and my youth was not the Boston of today, folks. The city was racist, it was anti Semitic. People of color could not live in the town of Brookline, where Kitty and I grew up. In fact, they couldn't live on this side of the railroad tracks. They could work over here, but they had to go back over there. Boston. It was an angry city. It was a dirty city. It was a deteriorating city. Um, our absolutely gorgeous harbor was a sewer. Um, the common of the public garden were a drug supermarket. Um, the transit system. Had somebody get the signal system working? <laughs> I mean, is this ridiculous or what? Anyway, um, it was a joke. I mean, when I was like 1974, you think the T's having these problems these days. The T was a basket case. We were operating trolley cars that had been made in 1942, and it was a real question as to whether or not when I got on at Longwood, I'd make it to Bar Street. Seriously, two or three times a week. The thing was right down. It was really terrible. Um, what's happened? Well, at some point, I think the collective consciousness of, of the city began the survey itself, for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, part of it was the environmental movement, I think, to some extent. Um, and we began realizing that we were tearing down a great and historic city. The Boston Opera House. How many of you are old enough to remember when we had a great opera house on Lincoln Avenue? Not many. Could replace it today for a hundred million bucks. Torn down for a parking lot and subsequently became Spear Hall. Seriously. Um, historic, any of you had a chance to read Lost Boston, Jane Holtz, Kay's book? Get a hold of it. And you'll see what we tore down before we finally came to grips with this thing. And we came this close, folks, to building the so-called Master Highway Plan, which would have absolutely covered this city with asphalt. Destroyed our transit system, which is in terrible shape anyway. Including, by the way, the so-called Interbellum Highway, eight lanes elevated, as ugly as the central artery, coming from the Southeast Expressway along what is now on the Cass Boulevard, that exists at the time, down Ruggles Street, eight lanes elevated, three feet from the Museum of Fine Arts, <laughs> right through Frederick Law Homestead Temple Atlas in front of Simmons and Emanuel. You with me? Through Beach Park and Brookline, for those who those of us who grew up in that town and love Beach Park, smashing its way across the road, 
over to Cambridge and through Cambridge to hook up in Somerville with the Central Area on the other side. I kid you not. And it was a done deal. Had to do it. The city would die if we didn't. That's not all. I won't go into other aspects of this thing. And it was a 10-year fight to finally kill the Master Highway Plan and get serious about building a first-rate public transportation system. And thanks to a sainted man named Thomas P. O'Neill Jr., otherwise known as Tip, we became the first state in the country to be able to use our federal highway money for public transportation. Couldn't bust the highway trust funds. Gasoline tax money had to be used for highways. And thanks to Tip, we were able to do that. My one great regret, unfortunately, is that when, when we put together the plan for the big dig, and that was Fred Salvucci's initiative, folks. Um, even I was a little skeptical. Put it underground. But Barney Frank said it would be cheaper to elevate the city than to press the island. <laughs> but the plan included a double rail line right down the middle of it. Naturally, we would tear up the city. Why not? Now, I was kind of skeptical until Fred said to me, we're going to connect North and South Station. Maybe that was part of the project. <laughs> and with that, he got me. And we went to work, submitted the plan, lots of support, went to Washington. Well, named Reagan was the president. He was a Californian. In those days, Californians weren't very interested in public transportation. And the Reagan administration fought us First tooth and nail the whole big day. And then we discovered we wanted to take one precious traffic lane and devote it to two rails. They were absolutely apoplectic. And this was 35 years ago, right? 35 years ago. Ronald Reagan vetoed the big big legislation. Imagine? Picked it up and vetoed it. Easy to override it in the House, tip was there. <laughs> but we started having problems in the Senate. And regrettably, we had to back off on the rail thing in order to get that final vote from Terry Stanford. Sanford, the United States former governor, United States Senator from North Carolina. So, we got the city and never connected with two stations. And we're at it again. And I think we're making progress. Although it's kind of slow. But I think we're making progress. Anyway. So here we have an opportunity now, folks, thanks to these good people and others, to really think ahead to what we want the city to look like and be. And uh, just a quick additional note for me. So what would I like the Boston of the future to be? Um, obviously a city that's prospering, creates economic opportunity for all of its people, that provides substantial amounts of affordable housing for everybody and don't let anybody tell you we don't know how to do that. We know how to build affordable housing questions we can put the resources into it. And at the same time, a city which retains the very special character it has. Now I know the man doesn't like me to say this. And I'm a fan of mayors. But I don't think a 775 foot building in the middle of the city full of, I don't know what, $10 million condos or something, is consistent with what we need. Take this is going to have serious effects, and I think more serious effects than we're being told on Shadows of the Common. And as the guy who knocked down the developers of the Park Plaza project from 215 feet to 90, yes. and it looks pretty good, doesn't it, at 90? Yeah. I don't like 775 foot though, even if they could use some money for parks and other things. This is a city you can put your arms around. This is not Manhattan. Nothing is Manhattan, but this is not Manhattan. And I don't think we want it to be Manhattan. So I think one of the things that we've got to be helping our friends in City Hall to do here is to see what kind of a city we want which maintains this very special character. I don't think when I was a kid, and I asked visitors, what you like most about Boston? They'd say, this is a beautiful city. This is a beautiful city. It's a city with human scale, with... Um, it doesn't overwhelm you. Overwhelms you with beauty, but not 
the size. And uh, I hope we can keep that in mind as we proceed. Anyway, enough for me. Um, I'm delighted that you're all here. I hope we continue to have lots and lots of good people and, and invite us. I mean, this is, it's a wonderful series, all you know, we've had a chance to be a part of it. And uh, of Ted's leadership, I'm sure it's gonna continue in the great tradition, Barry, that you set forth. So, enough for me, on with the show. So, um, I'm going to introduce uh, both tonight and uh, the, the series of discussions we'll have over the course of the semester with just uh, a, a quick background comment on how it was I came to be engaged in this process. Um, when uh, Mayor Walsh was elected, um, I had not known him before, um, but I had facilitated uh, some of the uh, uh, discussions that had gone on during the uh, campaign. Um, and uh, I became uh, his first uh, appointee uh, to what was then known as the Boston Redevelopment Authority Board. Uh, and it turned out, um, I think to the surprise of, of a number of us, that there hadn't been um, a lot of uh, members of that five-person board who had a, a design or planning background, uh, real estate and law and, and uh, finance and other kinds of things. But um, I went on the board as someone who had been engaged with planning. Um, and, and so it struck me that my special role was to uh, listen and to uh, try to bring something of a planning perspective to many of our discussions, whether it was around uh, handicapped accessibility or uh, environmental justice or uh, access, any of a range of things. And early on I was approached by a, a global uh, marketing and uh, design firm. Um, and, and they said, uh, we're not sure that we can really talk to you. We don't know what the process is for uh, talking to um, the new members of the board. And I didn't know whether it was ethical for me to, to uh, meet with them, but I thought, well, I can listen. Uh, and, and so uh, they came to Boston. We uh, had a meeting, and they said, you know, uh, Boston has changed very dramatically over the years, um, and yet in a lot of places there's still an image of the city uh, that is uh, driven by some very um, outdated iconography. Uh, the city is not about baked beans. Um, and more than 80% of the city, of the people who live in the city, didn't live here during busing, so they have no direct uh, contact with what it was like to be here uh, during that period. Um, and uh, the demographics of the city are, are dramatically different than uh, they were before. And, and so you folks could do with what it is we as a firm do, which is to say a rebrand. And um, we think we might be good at it, uh, because we've been rebranding cities in China. And, and they mentioned that uh, a great many uh, million person plus cities uh, have come into being in China over the course of the last 10 or 15 years. And many of them have been trying to create a new identity for themselves because they're so much like each other. And so this firm had gone and had spoken to uh, city leaders in those places and asked them who they benchmarked themselves against. And invariably they said, well, Boston, we want to be like Boston. <laughs> and so the firm had accumulated a lot of data on what people thought Boston was today uh, as a leader in uh, uh, the high tech and uh, medicine and finance and higher education, and they thought that uh, we should know what 
uh, people around the world were saying about us. Uh, and so I, I went to policy folks uh, in City Hall. Um, thank you, Joyce. Um, and it turned out, it turned out that the mayor and his policy people were already thinking at a much deeper level about what the city could become. That simply rebranding was no more than a surface level initiative. And that in fact, unlike many other cities around the country and around the world, what we really needed to do was to ask ourselves what we wanted to be. And that we had a, a clear endpoint in 2030, which is uh, the city's anniversary, wherein we could initiate a process that wouldn't just be about zoning and might not be only about land use planning and might not be only about job generation and economic development, but in fact would take a look at what the city has become and would then ask not just planners, but as it works out, 15,000 people across the city, what would you want this place to be? What should we become? And what has emerged, which you'll hear about now, uh, is the Imagine Boston 2030 plan. Now, <laughs> these things are like platinum. Um, you're looking at five on this table of, of, of the very few extant hard copies of this document. But you don't need a hard copy. You wouldn't carry it around with you anyway. It's posted on the planning and development website. You can read the portions of it. And I think what you'll see first of all is that based on any kind of planning document you've ever looked at, this is the deepest and most comprehensive city plan that anyone has ever seen, ever. It goes into culture, it goes into demographics, it goes into housing, and as you'll hear both tonight and over the course of this semester, it is not afraid to ask and confront the hard questions. So it, it doesn't just ask, do we need affordable housing? Every city needs affordable housing. It asks, what are the implications of building housing for gentrification? Do we need jobs? Yes, of course we need jobs, but are they only going to be jobs that graduates of our best universities are qualified for? Or are they going to be the jobs for the people who actually live here? The plan goes into that. Finally, I'll just say that it needs to be understood uh, that this plan is a framework. The details of what's in the plan and where we go over the course of the next decade or so remain to be filled out. And that's why we're having these conversations. Because there are details of how one addresses the issues, which will be solved by citizens and workers and academics and experts and people who are 15 years old now and people who are in their 70s. And this is the work that lies ahead of us. So having said all of that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Natalie Yaron. for having us. This is a really uh, exciting and unique opportunity and I hope everyone here has done their summer reading. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pass these around. Um, I, they all have GPS's on them so do not try to walk away with them and if you do I have my muscle over here Jason who will chase you down. Um, so we'll pass these out just so everyone can at least hold it and feel it and look through it if you'd like and I'll reference it obviously during this presentation.
So my name is Natalia Ertebe. I am the director of Imagine Boston 2030, and I have the privilege of working uh, in the mayor's office and with every single department in the city of Boston, including the BPDA, which is the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Uh, so Ted, you did such a phenomenal job introducing this plan that I don't think I need to do my first couple of slides. So I'm just going <laughs> to slide past them and start off by saying, this planning process is not just Imagine Boston. You'll hear from two of the plans up here, but there have been tons and tons and tons of planning initiatives and research and data that is all feeding into this Imagine Boston 2030 plan. If we had gone into each of these, uh, very specifically, each of these topics, we would still be planning through 2030. So we, um, at Imagine Boston 2030, used all of these different plans to really inform of where the final planning document would go. The Imagine Boston uh, process started off back in uh, September of 2015 when the mayor had just released a housing study called Housing the Changing City. Now that planning study basically outlined that in order for Boston to truly um, meet its needs, we needed to build 53,000 new units. So, with that, Imagine Boston came to life, and we um, went out for one year and just talked to residents. So for a whole year, before we put pen to paper, we were listening to residents trying to figure out exactly what they wanted the city to look like. What were their fears? What were their you know, top big ideas, uh, you know, limitless ideas? And we came out with a plan called Guiding Growth, which was very, um, very high level ways in which the city was going to grow. We then came out with the very first draft of Imagine Boston 2030. When that draft came out, we thought, oh my gosh, this is already really, really big. And it was not big compared to the final draft. Um, then we sent that out to all residents. We put it out on the website, we sent it to all the Boston Public Libraries, and we put posters everywhere. And we said to the residents, please tell us what is wrong about this document? Where do you want to see edits? Where do we, should we go deeper? What should we cut? What should we add? What did we miss? And we did that for about five months. After that, we came out with a draft plan, which came out in May. And that draft plan was, uh, we, we gave it a 30-day process for residents to go back, look through it, and really make any additional edits. The final plan, which you have seen, uh, came out in July of this year. So Mayor Walsh was adamant about making sure that this plan was not just a bunch of people in a, uh, sitting around a table making decisions for the city. So as Ted mentioned, we went out and talked to residents for two years. One year before we put pen to paper, and then one year really editing that and, and, and getting that to draft. We did everything you can think of. We had people hired to walk around and talk to people as they were getting off the bus. We did an online mapping tool, we did community workshops, and we did uh, there, uh, text message surveys, we did a bunch of stuff. We had lots of open houses, and Ted, you remember the uh, forums on the future which participated in. So more than 15,000 people helped to shape this plan. And here, again, is all the different ways in which we did that. So what does the plan say? Before we get there, I wanted to really talk through one of the handouts that you have. So this plan was not just about where the city is going, right? It was about looking back at where have we been and what, are, what is the research, what are the projections, what are the trends that are really facing Boston and how can we use these to guide our growth? So, Boston is growing really, really fast. We're actually growing at twice the national average. By 2030, and by, by 2030 we'll hit about 724,000 residents, and by 2050 we're expected to hit over 800,000 residents. That's, that's bigger than we've ever been. We're also, um, the demand for housing, obviously we talked about the 53,000 units, and up to 42,000 by 2050. 
We also are expected to grow by 900,000 jobs, and which equals 20 million square feet in, in uh, workspace. But Boston is a very dense city. We're not growing physically. So we needed to really think about where in Boston could we grow. That's a lot of growth for a limited space. So we talked about that opportunity for growth. What does it look like? Um, how can we move forward? What are the initiatives that really are important to us? So here are the six trends that we really looked at. We have a very, very productive economy. We actually are more productive than most cities in, across America. We have that growing population that we talked about. This is one of the most uh, startling graphs I think that I've ever seen and really captured my attention when we put it out. The median wealth for a white person in Boston is $247,000. For a black person in Boston, it's $8. There's no zeros after that, just $8. This particular graph was something that we really had to step back from and think about. We have massive inequality in the city of Boston, so how are we really going to close that gap and make sure that everyone in the city of Boston has access to that incredible opportunity. We also looked at um, the median income for our Bostonians. So we're slightly above the national average at about $56,000, um, but our housing doesn't reflect that. Our housing is two and a half times the national average. We also looked at what are the, what are some of the factors face, uh, that Boston is facing with climate change? Boston is the fourth most exposed city in the nation to the impacts of climate change, and obviously with Harvey and Irma, this is something that we're really thinking about every single day. We're the eighth most exposed city in the world. And how are we using trans, uh, technology to transform our city? How can we better use technology, what are the technologies that are out there, how can we become flexible and adaptive to technology as it comes out. If you would ask most people 10 years ago, no one would have said that something like Uber or Airbnb would be a real thing today, and here we are. So, taking action. Again, we went back to our residents, we asked them, where do you want to live, work, and play in the city of Boston? So based on, these are all little dots that uh, represent where people put stickers during one of our workshops. And as you see here in the yellow, these are actual quotes from residents that directly impact how we are uh, taking action. So finally, where that taking action part, where does that actually fit physically? In the city of Boston, where can we actually take action? So, not load. Okay, you have it anyway. Um, let me go back to. Ah. Sorry, everybody. Okay, so maybe I'll just start from here. Okay, so if you look at your handout, um, okay, great. We have uh, expanded neighborhoods, so every single uh, neighborhood in this city needs, um, I'm sorry, expanded neighborhoods is uh, the areas in our city where we have the opportunity for growth. So there tend to be low-lying areas, a little bit um, industrial or nothing at all. Some of those breadcrumbs in between neighborhoods, like if you, you know, happen to drive down and you see like a old um, like car dealership or, these are low-lying areas. And so we identified some areas in the city where we could grow. Uh, we also talked about enhanced neighborhoods. So every single neighborhood in the city of Boston has its unique fabric, but every single neighborhood needs a little bit of enhancement. And what does that look like? That might look like more affordability for one neighborhood, it might look like more mixed use for another neighborhood. And so really taking each individual character of the neighborhoods and um, adapting those. It also talked about um, how do we generate networks of opportunity, in particular along the Fairmont Corridor. So if you don't know where the Fairmont Corridor is, it's this line that kind of runs all the way down from South Station to Reedville. 
And that line, obviously, is the commuter rail, the Fairmont commuter rail, but it really is talking about the corridor as a place where people live and work, where a lot of uh, school-aged children, actually our largest school-aged population lives in that area. It's also the area with the highest concentration of poverty, unemployment, uh, low graduation rates, etc. Um, we also wanted to create a waterfront for our future generations and really thinking about what that looks like. And then finally, thinking about how do we encourage a mixed-use core. So in all of our high um, areas around the city, how are we really using those spaces to grow um, more residentially, uh, more business, thinking about all of those aspects. I'm really sorry about this PowerPoint, everybody. Um, so the, the previous slide really was about enhanced neighborhoods, and as I said, we really want to make sure that every single neighborhood has the opportunity to grow and be contextually sensitive um, to the people who live there. One example of our enhanced neighborhoods that we talk about is Upham's Corner. So Upham's Corner is the pilot that we're uh, talking about in the document that really outlines all, how all of these different investments come together. And we believe that if we can bring all of these investments together in one designated area, we can significantly influence that particular neighborhood. So as we think about, um, as we think about our mixed-use core, we're also thinking about the Shaba Peninsula all the way through 2100. What is it going to look like? What is our downtown going to look like? Uh, what are the areas where we can um, you know, combine climate change with growth industries and uh, really ensure that the downtown areas of Boston are both vibrant and growing. Here we go, this one came out. Okay, so these are the six ex expanded neighborhoods. Now, I did mention breadcrumbs throughout the city, which you can kind of see sprinkled across that app. But when we think about the six areas of growth, we're thinking about Beacon Yards, uh, New Market with Depth, the Four Point Channel, Reedville. We're thinking about Suffolk Downs and Sullivan Square. These are all areas where we can really think about what would we want a brand new neighborhood to look like. These are areas where there isn't a lot happening, um, and these are areas where we believe we could really tap into growth uh, opportunities, job hubs, and really expand um, our neighborhoods. We want to create a waterfront for future generations. And what does that mean? We want a waterfront for all Bostonians. Uh, as we all know, not everyone has access to the waterfront and all of the perks of the waterfront. And for a really long time, nobody accessed the waterfront. It was dirty, and it was contaminated, and it was ugly. And if you look at a lot of the construction around the city, our backs are really to the waterfront. And now we're shifting that and changing that. Uh, we also want a climate resilient waterfront. Right? We want a waterfront that can help us withstand all of the impacts of climate change over time. And we want a waterfront with strong stewardship. That really, we can't do anything in the waterfront, just the city. We really need a strong fundamental group of uh, investments and um, different you know, agencies coming together to really make that a reality. And then as we talk about these networks of opportunity and really the Fairmont Corridor, uh, we're talking about making sure that the Fairmont Corridor isn't just developed and you know, people are, uh, you know, market prices go up. We really want an area in the city where the residents of that area can stay there. We want to make sure that we're focused on economic mobility, racial uh, equity and resiliency, quality pre-K, we want to talk about the actual line enhancements. Um, right now, you know, the, the Fairmont line is, is, is a lot of investment um, as far as how many times, you know, what the frequency looks like, um, how people are using the line, and making sure that we are also talking about open space. And, and if you think about um, the Fairmont line that cuts right through uh, Dorchester, Roxbury, Mountain, what are those open spaces right there? One of them is Franklin Park talking about Columbia Road, we're talking about access to Mulkley Park, all of these things that connect uh, our residents to 
uh, better jobs, more waterfront space, all of that. So here's a, a map of how this becomes a reality. So we're talking about how do we connect the Fairmount and those expanded neighborhoods. We're talking about how we, uh, and that's up there is New Market with that. We're talking about access to transportation, um, more in, uh, rapid bus transit. We're talking about Upham's Corner and that example of the enhanced neighborhood pilot. We're talking about Columbia Road and Franklin Park. We're talking about an innovation district in Dorchester. We're talking about improved connections, frequency on the actual train. And then again, we're talking about jobs and in, uh, industrial growth in an area like Greenville. So what are some of these initiatives that we've talked about? We've talked about housing, health and safety, education, economy, energy and environment, open space, transportation, technology, arts and culture, land use and planning. So all of these different pieces are in this plan. Um, and as Ted mentioned, we don't have an exact outline to how every single thing will be done. This plan is a framework and we want to make sure that as we progress over time, we're using this plan to guide that growth. Some of the spotlight initiatives that we mentioned before are um, our, our anti-displacement approach, uh, universal pre-K, build BPS, greenhouse gas reductions, Franklin Park, immigration, and our industrial approach. So, we've come up with this big plan. What now? So, in the plan, we came up with these five goals. Um, and they came really out of the first document that we came out with, which uh, was guiding growth. This, uh, the second plan, you know, the second draft we was really a refinement of these plans. These are the five plans that we came up with in order to have a truly, uh, the, the Boston that we want to see in 2030. The other thing that we came up with with those goals is metrics. So what is a plan without its metrics? So there are 14 metrics that assign, are aligned with those five goals. And we came up with a really fun video, and you are sneak, this is a sneak preview because it comes out tomorrow, so. <laughs> the mayor will tell us all about it. Metro Boston is our first city by plan in over 50 years. Here's how we're gonna make sure that we stay on track. We set out to really talk to residents of where do we want to be in 2030. We as a group came up with five goals to encourage affordability, reduce displacement, and improve the overall quality of life. Increase access to opportunity, drive inclusive economic growth, promote a healthy environment, and prepare for climate change. Invest in open space, arts and culture, transportation, and infrastructure. Each of those five goals will have measures that will allow us to be accountable and to move the work forward. And after the goals were developed, we helped develop some metrics that would enable the city to see how well we are doing towards those goals. We gathered data from various sources and went back a number of years, oftentimes to 2000, so that we could see the current trends that have been happening. Now we're going to be able to update this data. Most of the time we'll be able to update it every year. And we will be able to see if we're making progress towards these metrics. Imagine Boston came to us. They were really interested in a dashboard that would lay out all of these different metrics and then allow us to track the progress and changes in these metrics over time. The dashboard is separated by each goal. And within each section, we have a series of different data sources that display a wide variety of information pertaining to the specific topic. The hope is that this tool will help us hold ourselves accountable towards reaching and achieving the goals that we've laid out in Imagine Boston 2030. more fun than I am. Uh, <laughs> so in order to see that metrics dashboard, you can just go to the imagine.boston.gov website and you can click on view the metrics and it'll take you right here and then you just click there. Um, we also uh, talked about in order to do any of this stuff, we have to actually put our money where our mouths are, right? So the city of Boston came out with um, its first Imagine Boston capital plan, and this is the mayor's capital planning pro uh, process for uh, 2018 through 2022. 
And what this plan basically did is align 77% of all of its capital investments directly with our planning processes. And that is a true testament of how we're going to make this plan a reality. You can actually look at, oh man, guys, this is my first time. Just kidding. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Uh, so if you actually go to our boston.gov, budget.boston.gov, you can actually read how each of these different pieces is directly aligned with the Imagine Boston plan. And that's something that we're incredibly proud of. The other thing that um, Imagine Boston has left behind and that we're incredibly excited about is this is a model for future planning processes. We've engaged over 15,000 residents. We've engaged, and through all of the different planning processes, probably another 20,000, I think we're calculating those numbers now. Um, but we've engaged a ton of people, and their feedback has really informed this plan. As you flip through that document that you're looking at, anytime you see a bright yellow little uh, box, that is a, a, a moment in time when someone told us what they wanted Boston to be like. And we took those, every single comment, I have a, massive spreadsheet, um, every single comment we looked at and we said, how can we make this real? Is it possible? Is it not? And then we were able to really um, use that platform for any of the future planning processes. The BPDA currently is doing a Glover's Corner uh, planning analysis, and that they've asked us to help them guide their growth and their planning process. So Imagine Boston has been able to do that. We've also seen tons of news about Imagine Boston, which is really great because we're getting people from all over the country and world to call us and say, how did you do this process? And it allows us to talk about what's really important to our residents. I already talked about the capital budget planning. And then looking at uh, future uh, collaborations. So we're really um, thrilled to be uh, done with the actual plan, obviously. You can uh, get the plan at any of the Boston Public Library uh, uh, branches. There's two copies, one for checkout, one for reference. Um, and then we've also now begun to implement, right? So what, how are we making this plan a reality? And as we begin that process, we're asking all of the academics in the room, all of the businesses, foundations, uh, state folks, federal folks to help us implement this plan. This is a plan that the city can't do by ourselves and we are really looking for collaborative opportunities like tonight. So thank you so much. I uh, do transportation planning for the city of Boston and the Boston Transportation Department and I'm going to talk you through uh, Go Boston 2030. Uh, just to put things in, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, just to put things in context, uh, under the umbrella of uh, Imagine Boston 2030 that you heard about, uh, there are different dimensions on different disciplines and one of them is transportation and Go Boston 2030, which was developed simultaneously with Imagine Boston, uh, talks about transportation. At the very outset of Go Boston 2030, uh, we settled on two principles. One, that at the end of the process, we would have a list of discrete, actionable projects and policies. And the second was that we would arrive at those projects and policies through a very inclusive public process. Obviously, that's an iterative process between uh, identifying the projects and doing the public engagement process, uh, doing the public engagement. But I will ask uh, today to uh, focus really on public engagement. So I won't be talking a lot about, uh, about projects and policies, but I will be getting into the details, into the nitty gritty of, uh, of how really to engage uh, the public. 
we uh, designed our public process uh, with some criteria in mind. We said that our public process should be accessible to everybody. We wanted the lay person to participate. As many of you might know, uh, transportation dialogue is often dominated by the same names, by the same people who show up at every community meeting and talk about the same issues. We wanted to open up the discussion as much as possible. Second, we wanted to find a way to kind of holistically capture what the transportation aspirations of this great city are. Somebody called it, what's the mood relative to transportation uh, of our residents, of uh, our visitors? And we thought we have to capture that in some way through our public engagement process. Finally, or not finally, but third, we wanted to make sure that the discussion wasn't confined to local neighborhoods. So those are important and should be talked about. What we wanted to do really was to have a discussion that crossed neighborhood boundaries. And finally, we realized that if people were to participate in our public engagement and participate in a fruitful way, participate in a way that they are confident that there is going to be some follow-up, we have to do projects, implement projects that are very <coughs> obvious, even while we are doing the planning process. So doing what planning was another design criteria. If these were design criteria that we wanted to follow and judge ourselves by, there were some other challenges that had to do with that have to do with demographic and transportation trends that we're seeing in the city. And uh, Natalia talked about those, and I'll I'll get to them, but talk about the transportation dimension for each of those. So, as Natalia pointed out in one of her slides, economic productivity is increasing at a tremendous rate. Yet there are many people in the city who do not have opportunity to access uh, that economic growth. And uh, the map on the right uh, shows uh, the red circles or the red areas uh, show a five minute walk to a subway station. Uh, the blue line, the blue and greenish area shows access to uh, public, uh, to uh, bus lanes uh, of key bus routes. But there are white portions of the city that do not have good or uh, quality transportation access to jobs. Uh, Natalia showed a slide of how our population is increasing and will increase in the coming years. Yet many of the new people who move into our city uh, have a transportation bus burden that they have to deal with. Uh, for very low income families in Boston, uh, their families are paying as much as a third of their income on transportation costs. And if you combine that with housing costs, uh, you realize uh, what, uh, what difficulties many of our uh, new population uh, and older people here too have been here a long time face. Uh, finally, uh, relative to trends, uh, we know that greenhouse gas emissions have been reduced because technology has become cleaner. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this graph didn't really show up, uh, but at the same time, we've, uh, we know that people are spending more time in cars and vehicle miles are increasing. Uh, we also know that, uh, the, uh, that the exigencies of climate change are, uh, have a huge uh, immediate impact that has been dealt with. So on the one hand, we have some design criteria to organize a public engagement process. On the other hand, we have some very identifiable trends that are a challenge that has to be addressed. So we organized our public engagement process uh, in two parts. We said that we would uh, go through an initial process which would lead to a set of goals and targets uh, that capture the mood of the city. And we'll start that with a question campaign that I'll talk about in a second. Once we have those goals and targets established relative to transportation, that would set a framework to do a second phase, which would be action planning, so that we could develop ideas that lead to projects and policies that address those goals and targets. So I'm going to talk about both these phases. Uh, and really, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to focus really on the public process. Uh, the visioning. We started something called a question campaign. And uh, the idea here was that uh, we wanted everybody to participate. And what's the easiest way to do that is to give an opportunity to people to ask a question. And we said, we went out to the public and we said, what's your question about getting around Boston in the future? The premise behind this was that our values are often reflected in the questions that we ask. And that bold questions can inspire a vision or make our concerns more visible. 
And uh, so uh, this was our strategy, and we said, let's give it a try. So uh, back in the fall of 2014, uh, at the, one of the Circle of the City events on Bluehill Avenue, we went out and said, ask people to ask questions. And we got a really good response. And this is just a sampling. And you know, somebody asked, uh, can we imagine where Boston, uh, can we imagine a Boston where public transit is free and for the public? Uh, when are they going to be flying cars? Uh, when I'm 29, would it be safe to travel around? When we started to get this kind of response, we realized that we're onto something. And so we started a massive uh, campaign to get the word out to encourage people to ask questions. We put posters out in, uh, in trains. We put posters out on the street, on billboards. We put posters out uh, on uh, at bus stops. And we basically asked the these questions. So for example, uh, will self-driving cars make streets safer? What's your question about getting around Boston in the future? And uh, sure enough, uh, Boston being Boston, we got an amazing response. and. We collected around 5,000 questions. Uh, people uh, gave questions in all forms, but uh, we created an opportunity for people to very easily submit a question. So for example, you could go online, and all you had to do was simply type in your question. And we asked for your zip code. We didn't ask for anything else, so that people didn't feel shy to kind of participate. And, uh, you could go onto the website, and you can do this right now if you go to our website. You could actually search uh, by zip code uh, what questions were asked from that zip code. So you could find out what your friends in Cambridge, uh, what questions they were asking, but you could find out what your neighbors were asking. And so uh, all these questions, all, every question is available uh, online uh, and can be read through. Uh, if you collected questions online, we also collected, uh, collected questions uh, on the street. And we had a question drop that went uh, throughout the city for a two-week period at 20 locations of every neighborhood in the city. And uh, this gave an opportunity for people to, uh, to kind of uh, you know, uh, write their questions down on a piece of paper, on, on the truck, uh, on an iPad. Uh, so there was a lot of opportunity. We lucked out that uh, the press had the word get out. Uh, Boston wrote a very really good article. And uh, we got a whole bunch of questions. So uh, you can ask, it's great, you've got all these questions. How do you take those questions and turn them into, into goals and targets? Uh, we have uh, a series of question review sessions where we work with over about 25 to 30 of our community partners from all across the city. It could have been a, a youth group, it could have been an advocacy group, it could have been a business group. And they uh, helped us sift through the questions. We randomly gave piles of questions to all these groups uh, again and again and again, and asked them to see if they could identify some themes from these questions. And well, once we started to get those themes, we kind of uh, you know, went through the process again. And uh, based on those themes that we identified, we established some goals. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, well, here are the themes. Uh, that emerged from those 5,000 questions. Uh, there were some that rose to the top, were particularly relative to the safety on our road, the reliability of transportation services, access to transportation to get to jobs or to get to play and work. Uh, one thing that was very interesting that we were surprised about was uh, the idea of experiential quality. A lot of people cared, they didn't mind spending an extra five minutes to get to where they had to go in a bus, if the bus was clean. Or they didn't mind waiting at a bus stop if they enjoyed the experience of, uh, of waiting at the bus stop. So it was interesting. Uh, we basically uh, went out and uh, we did a huge two-day uh, Go Boston 2030 uh, visioning lab where we put up these themes. We uh, made sure uh, just to kind of ratify from the public that these themes were the direction that we wanted to go. For each of these themes, we identified a family of goals and specific numerical targets. Uh, just, I won't go into detail, but just to give you an example, uh, relative to the theme of access, uh, a very specific target, uh, every home in Boston, uh, by 2030, every home in Boston should be within a 10 minute walk uh, of a rail station or a key bus route and 
a bike share station, and a car share, a, a car share uh, location. 40% uh, of our residents have that access today. By 2030, we want to go to 100%. This is just one example of a very specific numerical target that came with all the goals. Uh, our average commute should uh, reduce by 10%. Our average commute time should work. Uh, should decrease by 10% from the current 29 minutes to approximately uh, 26 minutes. Uh, the whole, you can read all the goals and targets in the book. I don't want to go into detail here. So, but the point here is that we now have a framework of goals and targets that were derived from all those questions that we received, which got us to uh, the second phase of our, uh, of our public engagement process, which is the action planning phase. And uh, how can we respond to those goals and targets that we've established through, uh, through a set of projects and policies? And we did that by, and I won't go into detail because it's very similar to the question campaign, we launched an ideas campaign. We asked people to respond to those goals and targets by suggesting some project ideas. Again, you could submit your ideas online, you could submit your ideas on the street. Uh, we went to uh, every community and encourage people to give their ideas after talking to them about some of the goals that uh, had been established. But there was another dimension that we added here. And it had to do with the idea round tables that we did in specific neighborhoods. And we invited people to discuss their idea, get a little exercise that you would do to kind of generate ideas based on those goals. And we had a simple rule that no person from the same neighborhood, let's say this right, would sit on the, on the same table. In other words, you had to make sure that everybody else on your table was from a different neighborhood. And we encouraged people to talk about transportation ideas that address those goals in a more kind of cross-neighborhood format. Once we had those, uh, uh, we got 2,700 ideas on projects and policies, and we went through the same you know, idea review uh, session process uh, with our partners and whittled those down to about 100 ideas. And uh, we put those ideas on a survey. And uh, we asked people to fill in the survey. Uh, I know you can't read it from where you're sitting, but essentially there were four features uh, in this survey. And you could uh, select a future that you prefer, and then you had to select two projects uh, in that future that you thought were more important than the others. And uh, lo and behold, uh, uh, you could, of course, fill the survey in many formats, but we actually got 4,000 responses. 4,000 people actually filled in a survey. Uh, interestingly enough, about 30% of those were from surrounding communities and were not from Boston, which we thought was fantastic. Uh, we, so now we had, uh, based on the surveys that were filled in, we now had a set of projects and policies that, we, that the public in general was supporting. Uh, the graph on the right shows the uh, the dark blue is the, this is my neighborhood, is the percentage uh, from that neighborhood of the total share of uh, questions, of ideas that were submitted or surveys sorry, that were uh, completed. And the light blue is the percentage share of the population of that neighborhood. And uh, of course, Jamaica Plain had uh, more people filling in surveys as a, relative to uh, their population. And, but there were some neighborhoods that we, uh, that did not participate as much as we hoped to, so we made an effort to get out to them to, to get them to, uh, to give in their, uh, to fill in those surveys. And then we, I won't go into the details of the actual projects and policies, but we adjusted uh, the popularity of, uh, of projects uh, based on the population of that particular neighborhood. But this was uh, just the public engagement process that got us to uh, a set of policies and projects. What I haven't talked about for the equally intense process was uh, kind of the technical analysis that had to be done to identify uh, how the needs, how needs are being, uh, are being met through products and policies. And that was a whole different process. We had a, a very good group with, uh, with good expertise uh, in the room to, uh, to help us with that. So uh, this is my final slide. Uh, this is just kind of, uh, we, we have now, uh, if you go to our uh, to our website, we have uh, a total of 57 projects and policies that uh, the city is currently pursuing. Uh, many of them are already in play. They are being implemented even as I stand here. Uh, and uh, this slide particularly has the ones that uh, kind of rose to the top. It's our kind of our top 15 or top dozen.
Um, so uh, I hope you'll ask uh, questions later on and I have some ideas. Thank you. Network. 
What we did was we signed on to the World Health Organization's Network of Age-Friendly Cities. This was um, an initiative uh, created by the, age, uh, by the World Health Organization in 2006 that were looking at all of these incredible demographic shifts, this rapid trend of aging and urbanization of, uh, really nationwide and internationally. So they put together a framework that said, really, how can we help cities adapt to this incredible transformation that really had never been, we've never experienced before, basically due to the baby boomer generation. And the, so in an age-friendly city, it means that we're committed to work toward having policies, services, settings, and structures that support and enable people to age well. Just like Natalia and Unique's initiatives, as I mentioned, we went deep into the neighborhoods. We had 25 listening sessions. We had three language-specific listening sessions. We had a survey in, four, in six languages. But in addition to holding these sessions, because we know that in a lot of ways that can skew results, right? So we also did a lot of going to where people are. We hear that term a lot, going to where people are. But that's indeed what we did. And it depended on where we were, right? Each neighborhood has enormous you know, variations in what people do, where they gather. Southie, we were, you know, went to a lot of coffee shops. In, um, in Roxbury, we spent a lot of time at the 12th Baptist Church, who had everything from the Golden Heirs to the 12th Baptist Swingers to the 60 plus veterans, like I said. Just amazing groups that come together for me. So in every, in every place, we held uh, listening sessions as well as going to where people were already living. And a lot of the surveys had to be done one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of times people didn't understand the language. That was a really interesting part of what we learned. Even if we had surveys translated, people didn't always speak the language, didn't always read the language, they spoke the language. And that was something that I learned. The World Health Organization uh, imagines really these eight domains as sort of the basics of looking, when you're looking at your city, assess it through these eight domains. These are sort of the basic things. Transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, community support and health services, outdoor spaces and buildings. Sort of the basics. But in addition to these eight domains, what we really found, because this is a five-year process, right, and we're, um, we completed two years. And during these two years, what we realized is that there were three other additional uh, layers or themes that really had to be addressed, okay? And so what we did was um, we interwove three other things. Dementia, which is an increasingly problematic, um, painful, difficult disease, approximately 10,000 Boston residents uh, have, and as people are growing older, uh, about 85, so if you're 85 and over, I believe you have 50% 50, 50 chance of uh, developing some form of dementia. So it is, grows older, uh, you know, it grows more, you're more likely to get it as you get older. The other issue was economic security, as Natalia had mentioned. Approximately 54% of residents in Boston do not have adequate resources to cover their expenses. So, you know, you're thinking of this amazing, wonderful, beautiful city that Governor Dukak has so eloquently gave us uh, some history on. And all of these assets, right, all of the, the history, the culture, the, um, you know, music and art and educational opportunities, all of these things, you know, are not accessible to everyone. Transportation, housing, these basics. So we really wanted to address that as well. And then the third, and in some ways um, most pernicious, is social isolation. Um, they're saying that it's equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and much more likely to be susceptible to a whole host of health issues, and much, much harder to reach, <laughs> clearly, right? much harder. About 38% of people in Boston are living alone. Doesn't mean you're isolated just because you're living alone. It, um, I believe what the, the description is or the definition is, is if you have one person 
that you rely on for your basic needs of communication <coughs> when you're socially isolated. So the idea is a network, creating a network, and that is what creates healthy, resilient, you know, neighborhoods, communities, and cities. <coughs> Transportation was noted as the greatest challenge to Boston and seniors aging in place. Probably not a big surprise. I just chose one. I wanted to highlight different things that we heard from each domain. 50% um, of all listening session re recommendations centered on improving Boston's walkability. So really very basic things like sidewalk maintenance, smooth sidewalks, wide sidewalks, not having tree pits, not having roots coming up, um, having benches, having shade, these very basic infrastructure things were things we heard over and over again. Uh, social participation, a lot of times, you know, there's this digital divide. So the older seniors, a lot of times, are not as connected digitally. And they feel very left out. They feel very behind. They don't really know how to access the things that, you know, they see sometimes later in the magazine. They say, oh, we would have loved that, but we didn't know about it. So this was a real big issue, really hearing about you know, we would love to know more about what's going on in the city, we just don't know how, you know, we find out about things too late. Or they feel left behind because things are online. Housing, again, this is consistent with every other planning process that we're involved in. The insufficient amount of affordable housing is available to seniors, and home maintenance like yard work and snow removal is challenging for seniors who want to live in their homes. Um, respect and social inclusion. There were some people who reported that their experience with service providers occasionally prompted them to feel lack of respect and taken advantage of. Civic participation and employment, seniors reported a lack of paid employment opportunities for seniors. That was one of the things that surprised me the most, to be honest with you, is how many people still wanted and needed to work. And that's actually one of the things that were, um, I may get into this in the, um, in the slides to come, but that's one of the things that we're working on right now is finding out a baseline of what exists in the city for employment opportunities and retraining opportunities. Because believe it or not, people still want to work. And um, so we're really looking deeply into, into ideas of really finding out what the barriers are. What is the reason that people can't work if they want to? Is it ageism? Is it that they don't have the training? You know, they're, they're, their skills are not up to date. Is it uh, lack of transportation op options? So before we get into the data collection, we are really getting a baseline of what currently exists. Now, a very good example of something that we may be able to do something about is that in some community colleges, there are um, degrees that you can get. You, know, you can be trained to become you know, um, in culinary or, or a nurse or uh, medical billing is one of these things that's very, very popular because of all the hospitals and very always necessary. And so you can be trained and you basically, for $1,500 to $2,000, you come out with a degree and you actually get, or a certification rather than a degree, and you actually can get a job. So when we're giving you know, a tuition-free public uh, college, it might be something that you know, potentially we could move into which you're actually giving scholarships to some of these training opportunities, right? These retraining opportunities where for a very short amount of money, people could actually be retrained to do new jobs. Um, communication and information. This is something that really has a, a basic uh, underpinning of, of, of everything we heard. The need for information in a central location. Community support and health services. Half of Boston seniors are satisfied with their access to the quality of health and social services, but believe there need to be more access to behavioral health services. We've heard a lot about that. So, as the need had said, they, they were very um, clear that they wanted to also be working on things while the plan was being developed. We have the same kind, we have the same approach. So, some examples, and this I think is almost my last, yeah, my last slide. Um, just some examples of action items that we've already started to work on in, trans in transportation. Now, with the elderly commission, you can get, you can uh, update or get a new senior charter card. You don't have to go downtown. You don't have to go to downtown crossing. You can go to the other location. So small, small little uh, improvement. Uh, outdoor spaces and buildings were developing and mapping existing restrooms in Boston Main Street dis districts. And that's actually a real plus because there are things that people say, well, gosh, I'd really love to go to that. 
but I don't know where the bathroom is. And I did, I did a harbor walk with seniors, and they said, you know, that was a great walk, but you didn't tell us where water was, and you didn't tell us where the bathrooms were. So I said, okay, you're right, you're right, next time I will. So we're creating some, we are trying to um, work with Main Street's districts and map and figure out how best to, uh, you know, to show where public bathrooms are. Is it all done? Um, can you guys hear me? No. I don't know what yeah, that makes uh, sense. Social, yeah. social participation. No. Um, I don't know what I did here. I did something. Maybe it, maybe it uh, died. Um, I think because it made it too fast. Okay. Uh, social participation, not the existing opportunities for social engagement. In housing, this is a really exciting one. Um, I think this is a pilot that we're working on with the Housing Innovation Lab, which is the exploration of a home share network, basically matching older adult homeowners with graduate students. And it seems, you know, like a very, like a no-brainer, right? But this is a very, very good thing. This helps, this can help an older homeowner stay in their home. If they work it out, it could also be something that perhaps they could help get help with snow shoveling, help with bringing groceries in, um, so this is something we're very, very excited about. So if anyone knows any older adult homeowners in the city, um, we are really looking for people who would be willing to do this. And this is with graduate students. We have a third party that came out of MIT called Nestorly, and they um, do interviews, they go into people's homes, they interview the seniors, they interview the graduate students, and they, and they help with the matching. So this is something we're very excited about, and this is where really this creativity is um, really where, where initiatives really thrive, is on creative ideas that are different. Um, respect and social isolation, we're, we want, we're looking at creating an age-friendly, dimension-friendly business designation, so certain businesses can be certified as age-friendly or dimension-friendly businesses, and they have certain features that will support someone with dementia or an older person. <coughs> and they would be recognized for that. Uh, civic partic participation and employment, I mentioned this before, with the Office of Workforce Development, we're creating a comprehensive list of existing opportunities for training and skill development. Under communication and information, we uh, want to leverage city data to advance equity, and working within the resilience strategy, pursue a study on the 311, which is the mayor's hotline, to identify gaps in service and improve accessibility. And our community supports and health services, we found uh, through UMass Boston School of Gerontology, I believe it's almost like 80% of older residents in Boston belong to a uh, church or a faith-based organization. So we want to um, really build relationships with those faith-based organizations. Um, I don't know where the plan is, but if anyone wants an individual copy, I'm happy to send it to them. It's also available on our website, which is um, cityofboston.gov forward slash elderly. And the whole plan is, is, is on there. There's, uh, it's a really an excellent plan. I just sort of so just skimmed the surface here. But I want to thank everyone very, very much. And I think we have another Thank you. So we can bring our panelists up and uh, let's get some feedback. Yes.
getting them on board early so that we want to make your act, action plans, they're not already making decisions in the MSUF. Thank you. Um, so the question, if anyone didn't hear, was overall, um, basically how are we working with state, federal agencies to ensure that they don't throw rocks in our way to get this plan done? Um, so this has been a very collaborative plan from the very beginning. We've worked with different state agencies uh, throughout the planning process to ba basically make sure that everything in this plan is something that um, others could you know, really jump on board with. Uh, so we, like I mentioned before, we've been working with every single department within the city of Boston and their existing relationships with different agencies to ensure that as we move forward with this planning, and like I said, this is very much a framework, and so as we move forward with this planning, uh, that we can continue to collaborate, collaborate with all of the different agencies. Um, obviously, the federal government currently is uh, quite a challenge, and, and so we are doing as much as we can at the city level um, to, to move the work forward and to not let those uh, obstacles really get in, in the way. And I think we're, we're approaching this really optimistically, obviously, and um, collaboratively, and um, I'm happy to chat more specifically about that with you um, later. Thank you. Sir? Regional planning. Regional planning, yes. Cambridge. <laughs> Absolutely. So Cambridge is currently doing their Envision uh, Cambridge plan. Um, and, you know, I think, I think regional planning is obviously really important. We've worked um, and talked through uh, a lot of the regional planning agencies um, and been really focused on to make sure that as we talk about Suffolk Downs, that Revere is part of those conversations. As we talk about Beacon Yards, Harvard is part of those conversations, Reedville, Milton, uh, Dedham. Um, so th again, this has been a very collaborative process. Um, obviously, every city is going to do what they're going to do, but uh, the mayor serves as um, I, uh, the chair of the Metro Mayor's uh, Regional Council, and so he has been really pushing this plan forward and making sure that as, as different departments, or, I'm sorry, different uh, cities begin their planning process, that they're really using this document or at least, you know, having conversations with us to push their stuff forward. You know, that also raises uh, some of the questions that uh, faculty here and graduate students here have been working on. For example, uh, one of the issues that uh, comes up consistently is around uh, whether the city can do more to provide artists housing and artists with workspaces. Uh, that opens the question as to whether they all have to be within the limits of uh, the city of Boston. Uh, is there not a regional strategy for uh, providing more of that kind of uh, uh, live workspace, specialized live workspace, uh, that uh, may long, no longer really be feasible within the city itself. So it means reaching out across a lot of the traditional jurisdictional boundaries uh, towards uh, more regional solutions. Sir? Hang on a minute, get your mic. Could you speak into the mic? Okay, I'm looking at the page where you have the wealth gap. When I look at that, and then I just, it's kind of striking. Because the public policy is a function of who, you know, who gets what, when, and how. Um, how can we build the 2030 without addressing this on the gap? Absolutely. Um, so I think one of the biggest challenges there is that a lot of that wealth has been built over time with home ownership um, and values of homes and, you know, uh, historic redlining in the city of Boston and throughout the country. Um, so that is a challenge that I think we're facing nationwide. Um, in the city of Boston, we have, uh, with D&D, we have the Home Center, um, who's really pushing uh, to help people purchase their first homes or their home they're living in working with um, landlords, how can we get um, uh, 
uh, increased home ownership. And so I think that that's one of the biggest pieces. I think the other piece is really access to opportunity. Um, a lot of these, as you saw, you know, our median income in the city of Boston is parallel, uh, basically parallel to uh, nationwide incomes. But, but a lot of the people coming into the city to work here are not making $56,000. They're making a lot more. And so how can we get um, ensure that the, city, the people in the city of Boston can really access those high paying jobs? Whether that's training, whether that's you know just access, like physically accessing the jobs through better transportation systems, um, and really working with all the different industries, you know, new industries, um, whether it's technology, medical, um, and really ensuring that our young people today have those skills to be able to access those uh, those higher higher paying jobs. I, I wish I had a better answer and just you know snap our fingers and be able to change it because it is stark I mean, it is stark reality in the city of Boston. I need a follow up. Uh, uh, then what's the plan? What's the action plan? It's, it's a function of transportation to all. It's a function of education. Or is it multifactorial? Which yeah, it's it. There's no silver. There's no so, silver silver bullet, um, and we were really clear about that. It has to be a multi pronged approach. You know, from everything from home ownership to education to um, access to jobs to bringing in more jobs to the city of Boston to making sure that our residents are trained and, and able to um, get there. Just to just to add to that. There are specific programs that are trying to address that wealth gap. So for example, we are trying to make through affordable housing initiatives, we are trying to get a home ownership in a very specific way available to more and more of our residents. Uh, for example, there are transportation projects that are uh, focused on providing uh, quality access in neighborhoods that are currently underserved, which do not have good uh, you know, quality bus service or do not have a subway system coming to their neighborhood. So there are specific uh, programs that are uh, trying to get uh, equality uh, as a uh, uh, make things more equal for everybody in the city. Um, I, I just want to pile on for a second what this gentleman said about regional planning. You know, I'm very happy to hear what you said. I didn't see that in the document at all. As I flip through the document, it seems to me that the structure of Boston is in Ireland. It has nothing to do with Cambridge, it has nothing to do with Rivia or Brooklyn or anything else. And I think that's a huge problem. And if I can encourage you in the city to do anything else, is as you're planning, as you're going forward, you know, make the state work with you and make the state make the, have the state make other communities work as well. I mean, you're talking about workforce housing in Boston. Well, it's too expensive. But what about Rivera? You know, what about Denham or Quincy? I mean, that's the, the thinking that I think that, I mean, you've started a great process. I would just ask you to expand it. Could I ask you, could I, could I, could I, is this thing on? No. no. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yes? Yeah. No? no. <laughs> uh, given the problems that you're going to be having at the federal level, and I think they're going to be It strikes me that state government has got to play a critical role. How has the Baker administration organized itself to work with you? And who is the point of contact? And who's driving the process of the state government? Because you need somebody there who's working very, very closely with you. I mean, I see state policy all over this thing. All of our questions. <laughs> so um, we've been working with the state on specific projects. Uh, if you think about, for example, I'm just going to talk about one example because we could go on and on and on about this for the rest of the time. Um, one example is transportation. Uh, we've been working with Secretary Pollock on um, aligning our goals. They're working on the Focus 40 plan. And we met with them today, actually, you know, and, and so I think part of it is working directly aligned, uh, in line with what these other agencies are doing. Um, 
Secretary Pollock has made certain pieces really clear, and then other pieces where we can really go in together and, and achieve some of these really tough goals. Um, obviously, everyone has read the Globe and all the articles about the funding infrastructure in the MBTA and MassDOT, and that's a big hurdle that we're all um, dealing with, you know, because as we are asking the state to invest more and more in our city, they have real challenges to face um, with, with funding. So we've been working with a lot of different state agencies on, on the program. Well, I think you need somebody at the state level who is directly responsible for the state role in the city. Um, and I don't know how uh, the Baker administration is organized to do that. I mean, I had something called the development cabinet, a guy named Frank Keith and then Al Rain, who would have been the point of contact. It's got to be somebody at the state level, it seems to me, that is working with you all the time. All the time. Now, since I'm here, I would... That was my I'm not going to miss the opportunity to suggest to you that there's a transportation project that ought to be an important part of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to devote hundreds of acres of land to the storage of trains overnight because we don't connect the two stations. It's just absurd. I mean, there are housing opportunities, there are business opportunities. Uh, with that circle, it would be a whole different thing. Do you use these places to store vehicles? It's really nuts. And we'll be happy to work with you. <laughs> um, I think we're making progress with the folks at the same level, but it's slow. Governor, don't hold back. <laughs> But in terms of the coordination here, and, and uh, you mentioned this point, how do you involve these other communities? Well, there's got to be something at the state level that's, 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 that's driving this thing. And, uh, and it should more, be more, it seems to me, than just kind of working this agency, that agency, some other agency. I mean, the, whoever's running the state government ought to be deeply committed to this. And on a regional basis. And uh, I think the best guy got there. Run the governor's office and, and create some kind of mechanism because you're not going to get an awful lot of help at the, at the federal level, at least for a while, until yep. what is going on there is going to straight out of it. Yeah, I, you know, I think this uh, issue is going to come up in each of our sessions uh, over the course of the balance of the semester. So please keep bringing it up because, in fact, as we drill down into each one of the subject areas, there'll be an opportunity to get an answer to that question. Yes? Uh, so I apologize because I, I came in late, but I don't know how much uh, mental health was covered. Uh, mental health and suicide is still four or five times um, higher than homicide in the state. And Massachusetts actually has a quite um, low rate of suicide compared to other states. And um, mentioned here is the fact that Massachusetts is a leader in healthcare. That's the largest industry in the state. Um, I'd love to see, and I'm sure many people would love to see Massachusetts as a leader for ending stigma for mental health. A lot of the issues described here, um, lack of jobs, um, burden of housing, um, so many of these things go hand in hand with mental health. You can't, I'm sure the people who are facing these issues are facing mental health issues as well. And so I'd love to hear more about plans to um, improve mental health in the state. I know as somebody who has a college degree, I personally found it very difficult to find a mental health provider that took my insurance. Um, it, was, it was sort of a shocking experience that um, someone who has the time and education um, and, and in a state, again, that has such great mental health facilities, or mental health facilities, um, still found it difficult to find, find access to mental health. Another area where state government has to play a major role. Now he's got to come. Yeah, we're going to be touching on that in several of the subsequent sessions on homelessness and uh, public safety and health. So that, that issue will continue to come up. Barry? Oh, Barry? Might as well then. Um, at the very beginning of your talk, Natalia, you gave us some data on the growth in the population, mm -hmm. growing from 561,000 in 1980 to 700 and some. Given the high cost of living, not just on housing, but we have one of the highest costs of living on everything, who are these new residents? <laughs> um, 
Are these all young people who are coming here and going to Northeastern University? Are they very wealthy people coming here to settle? Are they people who are working in the high-tech industry? Will Boston by 2030 look very different in terms of having even a richer population and a smaller population of you know, workers and, and others? Uh, what does, where are we going in terms of the demographics? So I think based on current trends, we are seeing that the population growth is a mix of a lot of young people, um, young, a lot of students from here in particular and all the other colleges. We're also seeing a lot of uh, uh, young professionals um, who actually are unfortunately, a, a lot of them are leaving the city once they get married and have children and start their families and look for property. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, we in this plan are very adamant about not changing who the people are that live in this city. Um, so we want Boston to keep its residents here. We're doing everything from anti-displacement policies to uh, maintaining the number of affordable units, if not increasing them, um, and really making sure that the people from Boston can stay here. Um, the mayor has been very um, adamant that this city is growing and we welcome that growth, but how do we welcome that growth while still being really true to who Boston is? And I think when Governor uh, Dukakis mentioned, um, you know, the, the people who have left the city and, and, and who are, is still here, I think that character of Boston is what makes Boston great. And we want to make sure that we're not losing our populations. And so everything we're doing is uh, trying to ensure that people don't feel like they have to leave when, um, when they start having kids, that they don't have to leave because uh, you know they can't afford the housing, that they don't have to leave because they're aging and they don't have anybody to take care of them. Um, we really want to make sure that the city of Boston remains as is and just grows and becomes better. Immigrants as well, obviously. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Ted's heard this speech a lot. Um, no, I, we have an incredible uh, growing population of immigrants and uh, the mayor's been at the forefront of that fight and making sure that uh, immigrants in the city of Boston obviously can stay here. Um, we found uh, when we were doing our research that um, uh, I, I believe it's 42% of all Bostonians have a mother um, or a parent from another country. And so that fact in and of itself shows how <coughs> Boston is tied to um, our immigrant population. Yes? Oh, sorry. I haven't heard any discussion of costs in terms of implementing these plans. Consideration in the plans of what the price is going to be, what the bill is going to be. Um, that is another great question. Um, so we have not uh, done uh, you know, a thorough um, dollar by dollar cost analysis. Um, the mayor's uh, capital plan for uh, that he released this year was $2.08 billion, and 77% of that is directly aligned with Imagine Boston. Um, because, and, and other planning processes, and because this plan in and of itself is kind of big picture framework, um, we, uh, pricing it out would be include everything in the city of Boston, and so I'm not, I'm not really sure that we could that. Um, if you have extra cash laying around, though, please feel free to, to share it with us. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Um, I want to congratulate you on covering an enormous amount of material and remarkable range and depth. But I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm shocked at one omission, and maybe I'm, I didn't get it. But that is, I didn't see any mention of children. And I didn't see any pictures of children to speak about, maybe some teens. And yet, when I think about it, the year in, the children entering kindergarten this year are going to graduate from high school in 2030, the, the year that this plan is aimed at. We have a whole section on age friendly, but you know, 0 to 18 is a pretty big cohort and probably as important as we can imagine. And I'm thinking about it in terms of not just education, because that's a huge not um, to itself, 
But I'm thinking about the question of what is the thinking about what it will be like to grow up in this city for the next 13 years? What experiences will the children going into kindergarten today have as they navigate the city? How will they overcome the kind of social isolation we talk about for, uh, for aging? How will they deal with the economic insecurity that looks ahead, that, that things look for for them? How will this incredible um, income inequality that we have be addressed? And so what I want to suggest is rather than kind of set the children off in a separate group, as a separate constituency, I want to suggest that as you put together your policies and actions, that you use a screen and ask the question, how will this benefit the children of Boston for the next 13 years so that when they graduate from high school, they will have had a vastly different experience from the children who graduated last June. I think that's a wonderful point. Um, I, I can at least take one part of it, which is that I didn't really get into um, the, whole, the really whole picture of what an age-friendly city is. However, really, the, the thinking is, is trying to move away from these creating silos and creating separation between ages. That's really the, I mean, we had to focus on something because that was the job, right? that is the initiative. However, what's very clear in creating age-friendly cities is there's a saying, if you build a city for an eight-year-old to an 80-year-old, everyone in between benefits. Those are arbitrary ages, but that is, that is, that's a saying for international like, planners and people thinking about infrastructure. So in our, in our plan, as much as I had to focus on, we had to focus on the older generation, many of these things and many of these improvements benefit every single age group, right? When you, have, when you have longer signal times, when you take a longer time to cross the street, that's good for someone who's pushing a stroller, has a toddler crossing, is a young child trying to navigate city streets, get to school on time. So these, these improvements benefit every age. Yes, I'm and that um, I, I think that, that the reality of the child is that they don't have the voice that the elderly and the 20-something and the millennial have. So maybe another recommendation is that you identify a handful of what I would call guardians ad litem for the children of Boston to be represented here, who people who spend all day, every day, of their lives advocating for, caring for, attending to the needs of children. And I think you would have new uh, insights, new ideas to add to what is already a remarkable document. Thank you. Uh, I would just uh, reinforce that uh, through two personal experiences. I served on a design jury uh, once where um, a young woman made sure that there was a pregnant woman in all of her drawings. Um, and, and people questioned her about that. And she said, you know, if, if you design spaces uh, that uh, are appropriate for and can accommodate a pregnant woman, you're pretty much designing spaces uh, that are much more sensitive to everyone. Uh, and, and I thought for a long time that, that I was very sensitive to uh, issues of accessibility um, uh, until I had my knee surgery this summer and I realized that for example getting around on crutches when it's wet out on many of the pavement surfaces that we have in this city is a very different challenge than just getting around uh, 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 under other circumstances so having a, a guardian ad litem in effect having a, a someone who can see through the eyes of the other uh, it is, I think, extremely important. I think you make a great point on that. There's the hand over here. Okay, I also think we're at the end of our hour. Is there uh, a quick last statement that anyone wants to make? I'll just say uh, thank you very much for coming out. We're going to spend the next uh, weeks 
a uh, number of weeks, looking at individual issues um, and, and opportunities that come out of this. Um, we're uh, looking at engaging um, some community people who are going to be impacted by uh, some of these uh, proposals and policies in these conversations. So I think you'll continue to find it interesting. Uh, please continue to come and please, of all things, uh, give us your feedback. Ted, next week, what's the time? Homeless, uh, sorry, uh, housing. Okay. Barry Bluestone, among others. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about housing next week. Um, let me also just say in that regard, um, we're not afraid to uh, talk about uh, the hard questions of gentrification, where people go and why they go there, and uh, a range of other issues that uh, we need to develop solutions for. We don't want to just talk about the problems, we need to talk about steps forward. So, housing next week. Thank you all for coming.